there is great power and hope. There's great power and hope. There is obviously a lot of stories that don't end, like in this story, who don't end with recovery. Um, and as Francis Chan said in the video, there, the physical story is great, but the, the spiritual story is way greater than the spiritual than the physical story. And there are many spiritual stories that don't end in victory. I'm going to say that most of us, many of us, whatever the word may be, struggle with a lack of hope in some area. We may not feel like we're hopeless, like we feel we have hope, but we, we have lost hope. Maybe everyone in some area has lost hope. This passage in Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to read a few passages to you, or you know, verses to you today. Um, in verse 3, it ends verse 2 with saying that we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And it goes in verse Three, not only so, but also glory in our sufferings. And the word glory is more like, um, um, it, it's, it's not glory as in like we're excited about it. Um, it it's like when James said this way, have pure joy when you go through all kinds of trials and tribulations. And it's saying that we're, we glory in our sufferings. The word suffering is really the word failure and our mess ups and our struggles and, and the tough times of our life that we, 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 take, we take solace in this. Whatever the word is that, you, that makes more sense to you, we rejoice some form in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Now, there's, they're going to give us a track here. That suffering is what produces perseverance. And our failures is what produces perseverance. That if we never failed, if we never struggled, we've never had the obstacle, if we never had to strive through the difficult time, we would not have to develop perseverance. That we, 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 so we have to rejoice in this because our failures produce um, perseverance. Um, Verse four, perseverance produces character and character produces hope. Verse five, and hope does not put us to shame. That word shame is really the word disappoint us. It does not disappoint us and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a process there about how struggling through the, whatever the thing is, the difficult time, Okay? That as we struggle through that, regardless of what the outcome of that is, that that struggle is what develops perseverance in us. That you have to learn, you're not born as a perseverer, you develop perseverance. And you work through perseverance, and that perseverance process then is what develops your character. And that character is what your hope really grows out of it, what produces hope. And the promise here is, is that hope will not disappoint you. Don't turn with me, but in Hebrews, it talks about hope as an assured expectation. Like Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, or chapter 11, verse 1. It talks about uh, that what hope is, is an assured expectation. Now, so we're not, we're not talking about human hope or earthly hope as in the wishful thinking kind of thing. I hope I get this for Christmas. Not that. What about an assured expectation? So biblical hope really comes from the stirring of God inside of you. The Holy Spirit giving you hope, giving you faith to believe. That's what hope really is. Um, in Romans chapter 12, let me turn that real fast. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, puts it really succinctly. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, be faithful, or somebody say, be, be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. One sentence. Three statements. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, into the struggle, in the failure, in the difficulty. And faithful in prayer. Now, if we just use those three as the three points today, let's say. It's not, they're not, but let's just say that's what we're going about today. 
Okay, it's easy to have joy when we have hope, right? Because that's exciting. We have hope. And um, um, like for our Cub fans, Cub fans are having a great year this year. Why? Because they've been lying about hope for decades. (laughs) This is the first year they actually have hope. Now, we'll have to open up counseling centers and all kinds of problems if the Cubs were to crash, okay? But the Cub fans are having a great year. I mean, they, this is awesome for a Cub fan. And, you know, and it could be many great years to come based the way it's set up. But the point is they're they're filled with hope. It's easy. When your team is doing great, when your finances are doing great, when your marriage is doing great, when your health is doing great, when your church is doing great, when everything is doing great, anyone can rejoice in hope. You ready? That's not real hope. Real hope, you don't know if you have real hope until it's tested by the affliction. You don't know if you have real hope until the struggle happens, until the the struggle in your finances or the struggle in your health or the struggle in your relationship or whatever it is. You don't know you really have hope until the struggle comes. Because anybody can have hope on a good day. And the third part it says is it says to be faithful in prayer. Now, why is that so important? I do not believe, I mean, there, you know, I'm not saying this is never, can never be true because God does what God wants to do. But it's not so much that the more times you say something, God responds to you, okay? The purpose of prayer is really to align my thoughts and my mind and my heart, my emotions with God's, not to talk God into doing something for me. Does that make sense? Like, it's not to be the annoying child who keeps coming, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? That's not what prayer is about. Prayer is not to say, okay, if I ask God like 19 times and he says no, I'll, keep, I'll ask him like another 19 times. I'm going to keep asking and I'll keep asking. That's not the point of prayer. The point of prayer, prayer is simply communication with God. And the point of prayer is for us to communicate with God, for us to receive from God, to hear from God, to sense from God, whatever that term is for you, and, and for us to align our way of thinking in our way of feeling, in our way of doing with the nature and the character of God. The point of prayer is to put ourselves in the position to be the best reflections of God that we can possibly be. That's the point. So whether we're being successful or we're failing, whether we're struggling through our affliction or we are celebrating in our hope, either way, the point of prayer is to align ourselves with God. Okay. When everything's going well, that is not very difficult. Most of us feel guilty at some level of the lack of time we spend communicating with God, of the failure of our prayer life. And sometimes we pray because there's a crisis. Like all of a sudden, it's like, God, please rescue me from this circumstance. God, still fix this, you know, please fix this situation. And and really those prayers, most of the time, are very selfish. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to have pain. We don't want to have loss. We don't want to make a fool of ourselves in front of people. Or we want to see the cool thing happen because it really feels cool when we're in the cool thing happening. That's awesome. I mean, if I pray and say, God, I want you to grow our church and reach all these people and do all this kind of thing, I can pray that prayer and it'd be really about me. God's not, when my motives are wrong, God's not, I mean, biblically speaking, and this is in the Bible, that when we we pray with wrong motives, God's not answering those prayers. I mean, I can pray the exact same words and pray them with the right motive. I can pray those exact same words with the wrong motive. But see, if I align my mind, if I align my emotions, the way I think and the way I feel, if I align those with Christ, with God, then I'm going to pray with the right motive. Does that make sense to you? You guys out there? It's not you guys there today, right? 
Okay, the, the, the point is, is that, is that so many times what we do is, is that we, we have, okay, I have a feeling, a thought, and we pray for the thing, but I, I'm, I'm not really being faithful in prayer because I don't pray on a good day. I just pray on a bad day. I think that if I prayed before my meals, that's good enough because I prayed before my meals. Or I think before, if I prayed, you know, I, I gave my little random, you know, God, take care of my kids, and God, do this thing over here, and God, do that thing over there, then therefore, you know, that, that's okay. And the, but the point of prayer is to have an ongoing communication with God that never really ends. Like I've told you this before, I don't say, a, when, I, when I pray publicly, I, I use the word amen at the end of my prayer so everybody knows I'm done praying now, right? But I don't say amen during the course of a week. I mean, just in my life, I don't, I never use the phrase Amen. Ever. Because I'm not ever done talking, or I'm done talking like for a while. Like I don't say to my wife, you know, like I'm done talking to you now. Or if I did, it'd be a problem. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I don't say to God, Amen, which is basically I'm done talking to you now. It, you know, it's just like I, I'm just talking. And so I walk, I, I talk to my wife, hey, blah, 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 blah. I walk in the other room, I, I leave. You know, I may tell her, hey, goodbye, I'll see you after a while. I leave the house. You know, my wife leaves the house. We're gone for two or three days from each other, whatever it is. We don't say, like, you know, we'll never speak again. It's like we have an ongoing conversation. That's just the way, that's the way prayer should be. Now, so what I want you to understand is, is there is a direct correlation between our hope, not just our hope on good days, our hope, and the time we spend communicating with the giver of hope. If your circumstances is where you get hope from, then your circumstances is what takes your hope away. The giver of biblical hope is God. He gives biblical hope through the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Does that make sense to you? I can start over again. Okay. Um, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For everything that was written in the past, and it's written about scripture, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance, or through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Nowhere in there does it say that look to your circumstances to give you hope. Look to the important person in your life to give you hope. Look into your bank account to give you hope. Now, I ain't gonna lie. When everything's going well in your finances and everything's going well in your job and everything's going well in your health and everything's well in your relationships, when your kids are doing awesome and everything's awesome in your life, right, and your church is awesome and your town's awesome, when everything is awesome, it does feel a lot better. I'm not gonna lie. That's nice. It feels comfortable for everybody. But that's where your hope comes from. Then as soon as it begins to change, so does your hope. Number one in the outline, we tend to forfeit the power of hope. We tend to forfeit the power. God gave us scripture so as we read scripture, we see that perseverance is taught in scripture. We see that endurance is taught in scripture. We see the stories of endurance, the stories of perseverance, the outcomes of those stories. And as we read those, I just read to you, as we read those, it should give us hope. As we interact with God and we pray that in the midst of a dark moment, God wants to give us hope. That working through our failures when it's the worst day ever and working through our failures and working through our struggles and working through our dark times, that that dark time, that working through that process develops our perseverance. Our perseverance develops our character. Our character develops hope or produces hope. And this says that hope won't it won't disappoint us. It doesn't mean that it will always be the way we wished it was. It just means that even when it's not the way we wished it was, 
that we still have hope. That our hope is not based on our circumstances. Our hope is based on the power and the authority of a living God who raised from the dead his living son, who not just forgave us of our sin, but who lives in us in the person of the Holy Spirit and wants to empower us. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, that's where we use that a lot around here. It says that God can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that lives within us. Now just process that for a second. We know it's in the Bible, okay? God can do immeasurably more, which is a lot, okay? Immeasurably, you don't have the ability to measure the amount that God can do beyond all that you can ask and all that you can think. And how does he do that? It says, according to his power that lives within us, talking about the Holy Spirit. You can't believe that verse without hope. See, everything about that verse makes no sense. That can't be true. I mean, I, mean, I understand it's in the Bible, okay? And lots of good Christians do this all the time. We, we lose the power of hope because we... We don't have hope to believe it. Well, I know it's in the Bible that God can forgive all my sins, but you just don't know how bad of a sinner I've been. Well, I know God can forgive those people. Yes, they've been horrible. God can forgive them, but God can't really forgive me. What is that? Well, I believe the Bible says, I just don't believe the Bible, it applies to me. Well, I believe in a God who can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or all we imagine. I believe in that. I believe that is true. But he wouldn't do that in my life. He wouldn't do that in the life of my church. I mean, I believe in a God that heals. But would he do that in my circumstances? Or would he use me to do that in someone else's circumstances? Well, I believe in a God who provides immeasurably more. I believe in a God who protects, or I believe in a God who... <sighs> I just don't know if I believe it in me. Or I don't know if I believe it in my stuff. Now, if that's where you find yourself at, if you go back to the Romans chapter 15, verse 4 verse, no, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 12 verse, Go to the third part first. Start being faithful in prayer. Start being faithful with engaging a living God who will speak truth into you. Who will give you the ability to recognize doubt and deception, fear, anxiety, doubt, that in the middle of your moment of overwhelmness, that he's gonna speak hope. In the moment of darkness, he can speak light. That does not mean that the moment of darkness goes away. It just means that in the darkness there is light. It doesn't mean that the God heal that person, prayer always gets answered. God provide this financial number always gets answered. Okay, my, my struggle in life, I've never had that. You know, the, the, the person who, they put their house in the market and then the next day it's sold. I, I've never had that story. Okay? Um, they, they, you know, they wrote a check they didn't have money to do because they thought God told them to do it and the next day there's a big check in the mail. I've never had that story. I, I have lots of stories that I hear from other people that I've never had that story. My hope isn't based on those stories. My hope isn't based on a God who can rescue me with the easy way out. My hope is based on this process of failures and learning perseverance and perseverance developing character and me figuring out, because as my character developed, me figuring out that hope was real. And that it was real even when I couldn't see it. And it was real even when I couldn't feel it. That there is great power in hope. And that many times what happens is we forfeit that power because of our lack of hope. 
We forfeit the acts of the thing God wants to do. Now, if we use the story that was in the video, I mean, they had been told that he was in the hospital in coma for 60 days. He was in there longer. But for 60 days, he's in coma, blah, 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 blah. They had been told after, you know, 30 days, wherever it is, he's brain dead and pull the plug. They just didn't feel it was time to pull the plug. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, I've been with people when the decision was made to pull the plug. But what happens is, here's what I'm trying to get to, is that sometimes God speaks hope. Now, in the father, there's two things happening with the mother and the father in the video, right? The mother was upset because her son didn't know Jesus. And she didn't want her son to go to hell. That, that was her problem. And she was broken over that. And her prayer was, God, if he, does, if he knows you, go ahead and take him. It means he's already dead. I'm ready to pull the plug. I just need to know if he knows you. If he doesn't know you, I need to have enough recovery that he can receive you, he, that he can have a, life, a relationship with you. I need to know he's in heaven, not hell. The father's deal was different. I mean, he may have had that too, but his deal was, I have failed as a father. I was gone 270 days a year, blah, 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 blah. This is all my fault, my lack of attention to him, my lack of engagement with him. I'm providing, I'm doing all these kind of things. I'm building championship in, in for the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. I'm doing all these wonderful things, but I failed my son, and he wanted his son to come back. Now, here's what I understand. There's never been a person who sat by a bedside and wanted their child to die. Don't misunderstand this. They were not able to talk God into anything. Here's how it works biblically speaking. Is there are times that God gives you peace to let go, and there's times that God gives you hope to hang on. Let you again. There's times that God gives you peace to let go. And there are times that give, God gives you hope. I don't care what we're talking about. It's your wayward child. It's your crazy spouse. It's the family member that is difficult. It's whatever the talk we're talking about. There are times that God gives you peace to let go. And there are times that God gives you hope to hang on. If your character hasn't developed enough, you won't know the difference. The circumstances look bleak, I need to let go. The circumstances look bleak, but I don't want to let go because I don't want to lose my whatever. Those, that's not the right question. The question is, is the creator of the universe speaking hope to hold on or is he speaking peace to let go? That's the question. It's not about how much God loves it's about the power of God. I can tell you lots of stories. But see, it's working through the process. It's learning that there's great power and hope. And sometimes when everything around you looks bleak, so you know, don't think about life and death and don't think about people in the hospital and people with diseases. Don't think about that right now. Think about just your life. Think about the struggle, the addiction, the, the, the thing that you're, the, the cycle you keep repeating over and over again. Think about the relational problem you're struggling with, think about the financial problem you're struggling with, whatever you're talking about, think about the business thing you're dealing with, whatever that thing is you're dealing with. Think about that for a second. Your circumstances are not the thing that has the right to tell you whether you have hope or you don't have hope if you are a child of God. Because the person who gets the final say, his name is God that he always gets the last word. And that when he gets ready to speak, he's gonna speak into you and he's gonna give you hope or he's gonna give you peace. Yeah, but it looks really dark. I can tell you lots of stories of things that look, our church is a story of that. 
long-term, hasn't grown, all of the kind of stuff, yada, yada, yada. Okay, there's no hope. We're told by the church growth experts that can't happen in small towns, yada, yada. I mean, go through the list. If we believe the circumstances, then we wouldn't be where we are today. Many of you are stories of hope. That people who had given up on you, maybe you'd give up on yourself, maybe you'd give up on God. You're too far from God. You'll never give your life to God. We see uh, grace stories or baptism stories on a regular basis of people who, they were far from where they are now. They were far from God in some form. And they made a choice. As you look at your life, it could be in you. And it could be in the person near you. Now, listen, I'm not, listen, this is not, a, don't misunderstand. I'm, if I give you a pep rally that encourages hope in you, that's a circumstance that's not correct. Does that make sense to you? Right? Okay, hope, biblical hope, is an assured expectation that's spoken from God through the Holy Spirit into you. There are times that I have believed stuff that no one around me believed. Why did I believe it? Well, even if I'm wrong, I think that God said it, so I'm gonna hang right here. The moment you abandon hope, you forfeit the power of hope, the thing that God's gonna do. Because God's real big into that don't doubt thing, have faith thing, right? I mean, Hebrews chapter 11, verse six says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. God's a big deal about that. He don't mean noun faith. Do you believe he's the son of God and that he rose from the dead? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking, when I speak life into you, when I speak hope into you, when I speak peace in you, whatever I speak in you, whatever I stir inside of you, do you have faith? Because if you don't have faith, if you don't hold on to faith, then you can't please me. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. So again, just like with hope, you, faith isn't faith until it's tested. Right? I mean, if, if we don't have something to test the faith, then we don't have faith. We just think we have faith. We only know we have it when it's tested. Hope, peace, those things are all exactly the same way. So, so if God stirs hope in me, I'm looking at my circumstances, my situations, whether it be in my church or my life or my community or whatever we're talking about, God's stirring a new beginning. God's stirring a whatever. God, whatever it is, God's stirring. And I'm like, ah, I just, it can't happen. I'm not willing to risk that. I'm not willing to stand and endure that. I don't want the verbal abuse that's gonna come while everyone doesn't believe this is gonna ever happen. I don't want that verbal abuse, so I'm just gonna bail. And then what happens is we bail. And we don't experience the power of hope. And then you know what just happened? Two things. All the naysayers just became true. And number two, we just demonstrated whatever you call that, an action, a behavior, an attitude that makes God look absolutely powerless. Sometimes our children grow up thinking God is powerless because as parents, we don't walk in hope and we don't walk in faith. We walk in things we can control. Our kids don't get to see God provide and God show up. They don't understand the value of things like perseverance through difficult times. Perseverance when it's not a difficult time, it's just a dry time and we just have to stand still while everything around us looks like it's wrong. Number two and three kind of go together in the outline. Number two, don't wait until a crisis happens to be and do what you, who and what, you already know you should be and do. Don't wait for a crisis to happen. Like in the dad's case, he waited for a crisis to happen to be and do what he already knew he should be and do. Let me ask the question this way. 
what's the thing that you already know? The thing that you already know you should be and do. The who or the what you should become. The thing that you need to deal with. The issue you need to resolve. Many times what's happened is, is that we just lost hope. You know, it's easier, you know, you ever had that room in your house that's just filled with stuff? For some of us, it's called a garage, okay? And, you know, for some of us, the garage has so much stuff in it that there's no, you can't put cars in there, right? Or it's the shed or whatever it is, you know? And the attic, whatever the thing is. And it's easier just to shut the door than to address the issue. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes that's not a physical room. Sometimes that's an emotional room. Sometimes it's a financial room. Sometimes it's a relational room. Sometimes there's just room in our life in some area where it's just easier to shut the door and act like it doesn't exist than it is to walk in the room and fix it, resolve it. That's because we lost hope. Some of us have parents that are older. And if we, we'd laugh about it, probably. But one of the things we're worried about is all those rooms in the house that they've lived in for like 70 years that have had doors shut for a long time and there's all kinds of stuff around that we don't want to have to deal with someday, right? Some of us emotionally, that's where we are. We've got a lot of doors we've shut, or financially, or in our relationships, and I don't want to deal with it, I'm just going to shut the door. Because everything I hear is great. The living room looks awesome. The kitchen is great. The master bedroom, perfect. The bathroom that all the guests get to use, it's great. It's always clean. But those two rooms, don't anybody go there. Or no one is allowed to go into the basement. And all that means is there's unresolved issues. Now, then there's a day it comes when it's like we get ourselves all fired up, we get our head right, and it's time to clean that place. And then to clean it, what, what always happens? <clears throat> you make a bigger mess trying to clean it first. Is that right? So if I come in like you're, half, you're halfway into the process, you know, a third of the way into the process, you walk in, it's like, oh my gosh, what just happened here? But we know because we see our heads right. We have hope. I will finish this today. So we've made a bigger mess because we know that this is the day it's going to be finished. This is the day it's going to get resolved. Sometimes the thing we're avoiding, I ain't going to lie, emotional, financial, relation, whatever it is, sometimes we have to create a bigger mess before we can fix it. But the thing that stands in the way of whether we start or we don't start is the issue of hope. So we just really got honest for a second. What's the thing that you already know? You don't have to wait till a crisis happens. What's the thing that you already know that you should do or you should be? What is the who that you should become or the what that you should do? That you already know. And my encouragement to you is don't wait till a crisis happens to deal with it. Third point is don't wait till a crisis happens to live and communicate the gospel. Don't wait till a crisis happens to live and communicate the gospel. It's not just stuff in us, but there are people around you who need to see Jesus. There are people who will die. Because see, what happens is this weird thing that happens in our head. Somehow we think everybody goes to heaven. That's not a biblical concept. Even if you were taught that in church someplace, that is not a biblical concept. People who die without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell. The Bible says not when you believe with your head, but when you believe in your heart that you're saved. The Bible is really clear about that. Jesus says, I am the only way, the only, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father. Zero people get to heaven except coming through Jesus. It's very clear in scripture. Don't have wishful thinking when it comes to the salvation of someone you love. Live the gospel. 
Sometimes there's people in your life that you've said all you can say to. There's nothing else to be said. All they're gonna do is be angry at you. All they're gonna do is be hostile. Like all you can do is make a bigger mess. And sometimes the thing to do is be quiet. But you live the gospel anyway. You forgive. You love. You show generosity. You be consistent. You live the gospel. Now, it's God's job to change hearts, not yours. I don't know that an argument ever saved anybody. But here's another truth. I need you to hear this. If we want to share our faith, we tend to want to share our faith to people that, you know, we, were, we don't seem to go, our children or whatever, we don't seem to go to hell. <clears throat> Sometimes the persons closest to you have already put up a wall and they're not going to listen to you. I've led lots of people to Christ. Lots. Lots and lots and lots and lots. But there are people that will never, ever, 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 ever hear a word I have to say. They're never gonna listen to me. So if they're gonna be reached, who has to reach them? Someone else, right? Yes? Okay, now think about this for a second. There are people that I have reached, that I, God has used me to communicate in a way that they gave their life to Christ. There may have been people in their families that had been praying for them for years. Matter of fact, I can, I can name names. Now, I won't do it now, but I can, name, I can name names and tell you stories of people in this room, for that matter, that God used our church, me, whatever, to reach, that they had family members who went to church that they had already blocked out. I'm not listening to you anymore because you're an idiot. You're a lunatic. I don't like you. I'm still mad from third grade. Whatever. But God turned their hearts, and God turned their minds. And someone, or someones, was used by God to communicate in a way that that person gave their life to Jesus. Rather than being focused on the person that you care about who's far from God, maybe what you need to do is focus on all the people around you who are still far from God. And trust that someone, that God will send someone else to the person you care so much about. Here's how I want to close today. Because it's not important to me that my message was good or bad. That's irrelative to me. I apologize when it's bad and I'm always surprised when it's good. When it's good, my wife always says she's the one who wrote them, so that's probably true. Um, but what's important to me is that when it's all said and done, that you have an opportunity to process something God's stirring in you. That's what's important to me. And the reason we do how we do our services, and we have, you know, we have worship at the back end, that's so you have time to process that. You know, the reason we turn off the lights at the end, so you have time to process that and kind of as much privacy as we can give you in the middle of a room full of people. That's what we do. So here's the question I want you to process. Is there some area of your life where God is stirring hope in you today? Maybe it's about a person. Maybe it's about a thing. Maybe it's about your family who lives in your home and the things you need to do when you get home. Maybe it's about some area of your life, like your finances or some you know, closed door of your life that's just, yeah, I don't want to mess with that room. Maybe it's about our church. Maybe it's just stop complaining about life so much and start being a part of the solution. It'd be lots of things. Is there something that right now God is stirring in your heart? An area where he's not giving you peace to let go, but he's giving you hope to hang on. Is there a person you stopped praying for because you gave up on them? Is there a circumstance or a situation you stopped praying for because you gave up on it? Is there an area of your life where you've been living out of your doubt and your fear and your giving up rather than living out of your hope and the power of a living God to change something? 
Is there a place where you're unwilling to persevere, to stand, stir, to stand firm in a spot? One of my favorite verses, uh, Exodus chapter 14, 14 says that if you'll stand still, God will fight for you. Or it says, God will fight for you, you need only stand still. Sometimes the greatest act of faith you have is not what you do, but where you're willing to stand and how long you're willing to stand there. Do you believe in a God who's willing to move on your behalf, on the path of the thing he's stirring inside of you today? And if you do, please respond to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. God, a church our size, multiple campuses, people who watch online, all the things that happen as part of our church, God, there, there are so many circumstances. There are moments of new birth and there's moments of death. There's moments where great things are happening and there's moments of great darkness. And God, I am grateful that you know every situation and every circumstance. And God, I pray that this is the day you spoke hope. That you reminded us of the areas that maybe an area we had even completely forgot about or hadn't even acknowledged that you want to do something that doesn't make sense. But I pray we respond to you the way you want us to. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.